Doet hij het nou? Ja. Check even dat je het opneemt. Ja. Lijkt hij? Ja? Oké. Okay. Ja. send you an email which you need to respond to if you're absent because we're very strapped we have 118 people registered for it and they only have uh, 80 places so I'm gonna mainly hit people from Hoogschool Zuid who oversubscribed but I really want to know if you're absent because that could yeah. allow somebody from Hoogschool Zuid to be <coughs> present. Yeah. So it's very important to uh, if you say that you're going please go and if you don't go it's fine you don't have to go but uh, then uh, make sure that you give up your seat for someone else. So that's uh, a small announcement to start off this uh, presentation. Uh, when we're talking about memory forensics, we're uh, mainly talking about uh, the RAM, uh, the main uh, memory of the computer. And I put up some uh, uh, statements. I would like to see what your reaction is to that. Uh, the statement contains unique data not found on any, any other media, disk or network. Do you agree with that? Or is it not? All the information should be unique. I should be able to find the information at other sources. Depends. What information could it be? <coughs> yeah? A RAM disk. A RAM disk? Oh, that's an interesting one. A RAM disk, yeah? But is it only a RAM disk? So a RAM disk is a virtual drive that only exists in memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they, they are common, well, they're easy to create, easy to use. And uh, they might, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, it's an interesting tool to use for someone who doesn't want uh, uh, some data to be found, to have it only exist on a RAM drive in, uh, in memory. The advantage of a RAM drive, of course, is that you can access it like a drive. Right? So, you, so all the other tools um, don't need to have any alterations. They just use the normal API. It's a very interesting view. Uh, but I think there's more data. Yeah. State data. Yeah. Stateful tools. Stateful tools, state data. Yeah. And um, but in general, yeah, sure. <coughs> Encryption keys, yes? Exactly. And I think we can go on and on. I think we can keep coming up with new examples and more examples. Uh, a lot of data is not consistent. Oh, jeez. I have to take on. It's wrong. I'm being choked by my shirt. It's wrong. 
It was a long night, preparing the slides, and uh, a tough morning, so, well, uh, okay, this is my uh, talk. Ah, okay, oh, salt, problem salt, ah, yeah, so much better. Um, but, um, yeah, I think we can keep, we can uh, keep coming up with more and more examples. Uh, a lot of data is not consistent. You also see this when you uh, uh, create software, that when you do software engineering, a lot of data structures and, and data of your software is never stored on disk. Uh, temporary file, temporary storage, temporary calculations, encryption keys, and you name it. Um, the second statement could contain missing, the missing link between data or other media. <laughs> Data from where to where, or any ideas on that? Yeah? Great. Uh, what? A rate setup. One disk. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, a rate. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a great setup. Good setup, okay. And uh, any other examples? Yeah? Oh, sure, sure, yeah, you are. <laughs> if, if you have suspect with a CD, suspect claims you never used that CD and the CD on files, if you find those files in memory, you know the CD was in that computer. Ooh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, point you make. He said, I never used the CD, I never saw the data, but if you never saw it, if you never opened the CD, if you never touched the CD, if the CD never make contact with the computer, then I shouldn't be able to find any traces of it in, uh, in the RAM. Interesting, very interesting, and that's true, that's true. Yeah, so, uh, but again, uh, as with the first statement, I think we can come up with more and more uh, examples. Also, data that comes from the network, uh, data that comes from the network, and save data on the disk, and uh, sometimes, like you already said, encryption keys, or uh, uh, Data is, is usually or usually can be transformed by applications, can be transformed by software when it comes from one uh, piece of from one, one source of media and is transformed to, to move on to the next form of media. And from a disk to a printer, from uh, disk to to uh, USB or uh, from uh, well network to USB or whatever. Uh, and here you might be maybe able to find the link, which is an extension of what you just said about the CD. Uh, it, it, not only can you see if it entered the system, but you can also see where it entered and where it left uh, the system. Uh, we, we will see more examples later on in the, in the series. Uh, contain information about the state of the system and devices. I think that's most clear. Uh, I think most of us can form an example of that. Uh, was a process loaded? Uh, had it been run? Uh, uh, did you open a file? Did you? Uh, where were you uh, in in the application? What what did you do in the application? Which actions did you do in the application? Uh, uh, maybe because we will get to this later on in the series, but. Uh, Maybe one of you is already, or more of you are already uh, so smart to figure out how I might be able to trace uh, which parts of an application uh, might have been used or not. And, and uh, let, let's start with Windows, because Windows is a, uh, uh, we are so lucky, uh, we are so lucky that uh, most computers so far right, in, the, in the world uh, uh, that, that are examined are Windows computers, and Windows computers are, uh, in a way, they are nice and easy to read. Uh, they, they have a lot of data, in them, a lot of unique data, a lot of unique data structures. Uh, probably more or easier to access and easier to understand. 
than uh, system flight uh, units or lines because they use different structures, different methods, which uh, in itself may be easier uh, or may make it more difficult to figure out what happens in memory, especially in memory. Uh, but if we go, if we think about Windows, if we think about a typical Windows application, and not a small one, but a normal average size application. How could we figure out where, what parts have been used and which parts haven't? Yeah. There should be two ways. Okay. One is the page cache, so if we read that thing, mm -hmm. the red data from the disk uh, ends up in memory, so yeah. it's more easily accessible, it's cached. And the other way should be, well, if you use an application, uh, the parts you use should be instantiated in memory because you have to have the memory to execute. To have the data structures for those parts of the application you're using loaded. Yes. So that's definitely true. We should be able to find the memory, but the memory might have or might also have been uh, uh, free. Right. I mean, it's possible that this application was written correct. I mean, a lot of applications have all the memory leaks and don't free memory. But let's suppose that, of course, this application that we are investigating. Uh, does all the, the, the memory management very good and uh, immediately releases the memory after we've used it. Yeah, I see another. But that doesn't get rid of the page cache. That doesn't get rid of the page cache. How long? How volatile is the page cache? Depends on your operating system and the configuration of your operating system. Mm -hmm. And Windows is pretty sticky as long as they have free memory. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But I'm thinking about something else. You're correct. You're absolutely correct. But there's another way. There's even another way in Windows to figure out a lot of find a lot of information. Yeah, you could look at the process metadata on the software. Yes. To see where the application where the application is. Uh, yeah, we can look at the process metadata. And in particular, uh, Windows applications that they use uh, Most applications don't have, don't use all their own code. They, they oh, yeah, the borrow code. Don't have frameworks. So don't have framework, for example. How does that work? If, if an application borrows code from the operating system or from other, it's, it's a library. So it's a library. The application uses the in memory. Yeah, a library and. Does it have a name in Windows? Can we, does it have a file yeah. extension that DLL. we all know? A what? DLL. A DLL. Yeah. A DLL is a, is a very good giveaway in Windows. That, um, DLLs are uh, uh, they're usually dynamically loaded, uh, as they should. And you can, uh, uh, these are very easy to trace. The, the DLLs that are loaded and the DLLs that are unloaded. And uh, if you know the, uh, the structure of the application, and you know uh, where which libraries are used, uh, that could give some evidence on uh, exactly what you not just said with your CD. Uh, if you access a part of the application, the DLLs uh, related to that part of the, of the application will be loaded. And it's, it's a very, uh, very analog to what you were saying with the CD. Uh, so it's a, it's a giveaway. So you see, there's so many ways. This is very good. I'm, I'm very happy uh, that we already find so many ways to figure out a lot of things. But we're not there yet. Uh, with memory forensics, time is a factor. By the way, before I continue, uh, uh, I, would, I, I would very much would like to uh, point out this uh, paper. I don't know if you've uh, already read it. Uh, a survey on main memory acquisition and analysis techniques for the Windows operating systems. Um, this is a fantastic uh, paper. I, I will put it on PLO. Uh, so you can download it. It's very easy. If you Google the name, you have the PDF file. And it's very interesting because it, uh, it provides a lot of information about uh, uh, research in the field of. Uh, memory acquisition and Windows, the 
Windows operating system is just a, a, just a, yeah, just a, a tool or an example or a I mean, it's, it's not directly related to Windows, more to a, a general a memory acquisition techniques. Uh, time is effective. Uh, Jaap already told it in his uh, <coughs> presentation that over time, memory changes. Memory deteriorates. Even if you try to freeze it, you can't, I mean, you can, but you also can't. I mean, the hardware will change, the states will change, the memory the bits will change. And if, if you don't freeze it, yeah, it, by definition, it's RAM, so it's, it, it will change. So uh, time is definitely a factor. If you use tools, they are obtrusive. If we want to uh, to capture the data, we, it's, it's a running system, and I, I think you already pointed out that there are some good methods to uh, try to do it in hardware, like to, to sneak the data out of RAM. Did, what, what, what did you do? Had some good ideas about that? The bus or something? Or? No? Maybe I'm, I'm mistaken. But, uh, I've overheard something.
Yes, we have all sorts of problems. Maybe I should already tell you, I mean, uh, to, to let the cat out of the box, that as, I mean, at the moment we have no good way of, uh, of, of making a copy, a good copy of uh, the RAM. I'm very sorry if you, that maybe I shouldn't have told this in the beginning, because uh, maybe you will all leave now and say, well, it can be done, so bye. No, 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 no. Uh, there's a lot of research in this field, and uh, we need to continue that. That we can use the tools and the tricks and the knowledge that we have now to, to do the best we can. But a good solution is not there. It just, it's not there. Every solution that they come up with has flaws and it does not work the way that it's not perfect. And we will see why. Uh, but they're getting better and better. But also the environment changes a lot. You get a lot more encryption, for example, which makes it a lot harder as well. Uh, tools are intrusive. This is another interesting point. The tools that you use, you use them in an untrusted environment. Because that's the whole problem with the system. Uh, if you take the plug out, <coughs> for example, the hard disk, I mean, the hard disk you can copy and you, you have the, hard, the, the, the copy of your hard drive is in your own uh, trusted environment. And so uh, it's, it's very hard to temper with your environment uh, if, from, from, from the hard disk perspective or, or through the hard disk. But you have a running system with a running operating system. And let's say, well, even if we use a hardware tools, but let's say we use software tools. These software tools, we somehow almost need to run them on the operating system of the target. And we, we cannot trust it. It will, it, I mean, depending on, uh, let's, uh, uh, depending on, uh, on, 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 the, on the subject, they might try a lot of tricks to hinder us in our work. If you look at the uh, OM, uh, the, the famous uh, case uh, in the Netherlands about the child pornography. Uh, it's interesting to look at people like that, uh, in, uh, because they are not, uh, they are computer literate. They are not computer experts, <coughs> they, they don't know everything about them, but they are very computer literate. And they are in groups, there, there has been a new documentary on the Dutch TV about uh, 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 female uh, child molesters. And uh, the interesting thing, no, but if you look at these, uh, these documentaries, it's interesting from, from our perspective to see uh, the character of these people and what they do. And what she kept repeating, uh, they had one of the, the molesters there, and they, they, were, they, they had a hidden camera and they were talking with her, blah, blah, blah. And what she kept saying is, you need to be careful, you need to, all sorts of tricks that they share. Uh, you need to use this kind of encryption, <coughs> you shouldn't uh, 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 share on the internet, you shouldn't talk about it. So. Uh, they get smart friends, they are computer literate. Right? So they, they know, they learn what is around, they know which tools there are, which tools are very effective. And for example, Robert M., he knew that TrueCrypt was very effective. And it was very effective. Right? If he, if, it, was, it was very effective. I mean, he gave his password, but uh, had he not given his password, they would have had a serious problem. Very effective. And it is very likely that it will get better and better. And there will be more and more tools also to prevent uh, memory corrections. Uh, okay. um, not repeatable. Yes? Just before concerning the encrypted piece on the ground for that specific use case, um, of course, after the paper was published, I think that it was, um, there were immediately screens to move the storage of the encryption keys from the RAM to the L2 cache. Yeah. And getting code to the L2 cache is yeah. problematic. Exactly. I'm very happy that you mentioned it. I, I tried to keep my mouth shut about it uh, because it's later on in the presentation. No, 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 no. No, I'm happy you brought it up because this is yet another problem. I mean, I, I already gave away that there as of today, there are no perfect methods to get a good. This is a huge opportunity for, for all of us 
especially for the university students, to do research in the field and to get famous. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, take the last step, that uh, find the, the perfect tool uh, uh, or the perfect method to do it. But uh, this is yet another obstacle. We have layers of, 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 of RAM. Now, there is not one RAM, there are several layers of RAM. We have the main memory, and that's the, that's the easiest part for us to, to capture. But then there's also levels of cache, where there's all sorts of intermediate. That it's, it is like the hard drive. Uh, it's like the hard drive where the structure of the hard drive is partly in memory. Uh, the, 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 the old problem that we had with, uh, especially with Linux and Unix systems, that if your power was lost, you had a very good chance that your hard disk was ruined as well. Because of all the I know tables were only stored in RAM and only updated uh, at idle times. And now we have uh, journaling systems and, uh, to prevent all that, these problems. But we have a similar problem with the RAM. Uh, there's a lot of intermediate data in all the caches. And uh, this, this makes that the, the, the physical RAM that we can see is probably inconsistent. Uh, because the inconsistencies are hidden in the, in the, in the, in the cache that we cannot, uh, by hardware, it's very difficult to get them out. Uh, not repeatable, no. I mean, this calls for the problem that it changes over time. And yes? Do um, forensic investigators then to repeat memory dumps and compare them to see how it changes in time? Or? Uh, no, no, that, that, that's, no, you cannot. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems. You, uh, you, you cannot repeat it. I mean, if, if the system is running and you take a memory dump, yeah, almost by definition, if you make another dump in a later moment of time, it's going to be different. But some parts will be the same, right? Some parts will be the same, yeah. And you could, but I don't know, I don't uh, know uh, that it's done. No. Maybe Jaap uh, knows, but uh, I think that they only make uh, one uh, copy and uh, that's it. Uh, also, because uh, uh, as, of, uh, as of today, there is no perfect method. So maybe uh, you could use uh, uh, memory forensics to uh, help uh, the other forensics. Huh? Like for example, if you get the encryption key from, uh, uh, from the RAM and you can decrypt code that is on the hard disk, uh, yeah, and the hard disk we know is, is, is solid evidence. And that is, so it, it, it might help us in our other investigation. Uh, so yeah, at the moment, uh, memory forensics is, uh, is, is, is difficult, and it's, it will be very difficult to. Uh, uh, we will see in a slide, in a, in a, in a following slide, we will see that uh, uh, the, the analysis is something that we can repeat. If the acquisition is done, then uh, the acquisition is, is, is the biggest problem. Uh, so if we if we've done the acquisition. And we can somehow make that a valid acquisition. That, that's, we say, well, we did the best we can, and we say this is, this is valid. If we, if we can prove the acquisition was valid, that this we can repeat. Because from this point, we have a static uh, uh, memory dump. But the acquisition is not repeatable in general. Or you have to go back in time. And I don't know of any time machine. I know that Stewie has one. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was it. They keep repeating that on uh, Comedy Central now. And, uh, no, it's not what he did, but it's what he did. It's what you guys did. Great. Um, this is a slide that uh, Jaap has all, already shown, I believe, from uh, Tegema and Farmer, that uh, uh, the, the, the different levels of uh, volatility. And we see that the register of energy inside a CPU changes uh, uh, yeah, millions, billions of times per second. So that's, uh, uh, and we see that main memory also changes at a very rapid uh, rate. Acquisition in an untrusted environment. Analysis, we try to do that in a trusted environment. Uh, so we try to capture the data. But once we have it, it's, it's very similar to a hard drive. But the, with the hard drive, it's easier to, 
to acquire it. And take it out and uh, well, you have to document it, but it gives you the, the ransom. The problem is the acquisition part. Uh, <coughs> analysis is, uh, is then not limited or under control of the uh, target uh, OS. If we, if we manage to get a good uh, acquisition. And analysis is repeatable, but the acquisition is not. So the problem is in the acquisition. 